Sure. Yeah, I'm going to speak with the script that my name is Yong Yu Chen. You can go by YY. And the title of my walk is Write Python for Speed. But I'm going to tell you that I also am actually going to talk a lot about C++. <laughs> so spoiler alert. My presentation will be in English, which you know right now, and uh, I will have that material uploaded later, but uh, the slide will be in English as well. So you can stop me anytime if you want, and I will control the time and try to respond to you, and I hope that I will also leave some time at the end so that we can have some discussions. So I'm from Taiwan, and uh, I write uh, high-performance code for living and for fun. So by high performance code, uh, we care about the runtime. Uh, I've heard that uh, this is a great country of Japan and they are building something that's going to run 500 kilometers per hour and make it commercially run in next decade. So this is the kind of speed that I'm going to talk about. The speed that will deliver and uh, that the people will enjoy and it will be merchandisable so that uh, we all want it. That is kind of the things that uh, we human as a race that we race for. We just can't wait, right? We want something and we want it now. If there's a deadline, that is yesterday, right? No? Well, that's what my boss told me. Uh, so we want something to be fast. We want something that can run very fast and we can get results as early as possible. So that's about the wrong time. <clears throat> and when do we want it? When we want that optimal speed, when we are doing the calculation, in my case and in many of the cases, that uh, is the numerical calculation. Okay. So this is a, a dummy. Uh, an example problem that uh, we, we kind to exemplify what is uh, the kin speed. That uh, imagine that we have a partial differential equation to solve. That uh, we first formulate that, which take uh, some centuries for people to figure it out. And right now it is presented as a nice mathematical formulation and we have the condition, so it uh, formulates a complete problem that we can solve. Uh, we actually have the exact analytical solution for that, and that is why we choose this as a model problem for us to study the runtime and the speed. There are many numerical methods developed for this type of problem, so one of them is uh, what we call the Point Jacobi method. It can time march and get the, uh, get the exact, uh, sorry, not exact, the numerical solutions for the problem, okay? Of course, we have the exact solution already, then why do we ever want to numerical uh, solve it? Because sometimes like, we, in some arrangement, like, we do not have an analytical solution. So we will develop the uh, uh, program, and uh, this is the example about the comparison about how fast or slow the implementation can be. That in different language or different ways to write it, you will get different speed. That is because uh, the programming language or the runtime of the programming language are making different assumptions for the calculation. For example, that uh, if I use a Python naive implementation as a baseline, that is running like uh, five seconds. Not so bad, right? But remember, this is a simple problem. If we migrate to use NumPy, which has a lot of low-level helpers available for calculating the numbers, we got almost 100x faster, 87, okay, imprecise. But if we move this whole code to C++, I would say it is beautiful. Well, very few people say C++ is beautiful, right? Who likes to write C++? No. Oh, oh sorry. The, really? Ah, oh, wow, amazing. <laughs> well, well, to be honest, I cannot say I like to write C++. It usually tortures me, but to these algorithms, you see, it is very, very similar 
to the Python code, right? It's pretty simple. And look at that uh, NumPy version. You don't like it, right? Because it's not very easy. Or well, let's put it straight, it's hard to understand. Python, especially in NumPy, it's hard to understand. And what did we get by moving to C++? Easier to read and write algorithm and twice as fast as NumPy, which is very nice, right? Of course, there are a lot of caveats behind it. These are other examples that uh, when we are writing program for speed, of course, there are many, many other applications. This is uh, more involved the partial and differential equations that we call conservation laws, and we can solve for complex arrangement and the physics. So you can generate very beautiful pictures from that. And of course, useful numbers when you are dealing with some aerospace uh, or engineering problems. The procedures to develop these kind of applications are rather involved. I call this as a problem of the wall of complexity, that you do have a lot of uh, thinking process to follow that, uh, because in the beginning, you do not get the problem for free. You actually encounter some challenging blocks on the road that you cannot solve, and you need to see what they are and where they are, and to define the problem and uh, try to formulate it in a way that you can, of course, make a, making a lot of assumptions so that you get the formulation or the analytical solution for it, so that you know you are on the right track. But then you hit the wall of complexity. You do not really know how to extend that, uh, like those simple square problem that we showed before, uh, to a really complicated uh, shape, uh, like in this room with a lot of chairs, right? You hit the wall of complexity then you need the software to help you to, move, uh, to rearrange your problem and to apply the simple uh, relations or formulated in the equations to try to solve the problem in a realistic configuration. Both of the observ observation and formulating process is a circle that you iterate them. And once you get reach a a certain level of maturity, then you need to develop your code, which is another, another circle of evolution. And the wall actually separates two different mindsets. One is how you observe the world and try to formulate it. The other is that how you take the problem and try to, try to build an architecture for people can program for it and on it. So this is a challenge that we usually face when we are trying to get the numerical solution, and especially so when we want to sell the results. So uh, this has been there for decades, so that, that the uh, approaches that people come up with is that, okay, let's do a hybrid architecture. So, we ask programmers that we actually like to write Python. So if I have to make a comparison between Python and C++, for no, for absolutely I will choose for Python. But we know that uh, Python is not so fast, and we want performance, and we want to write the fast program. So the approaches that we usually take is that we combine the best of the two worlds together that uh, uh, I heard from many, many, many places that uh, I think last time I heard about a quote from Wes McKinney, that uh, Python is the language, Python, Python is the second best language for everything. That is very insightful, think about it. That of course, it's probably not the best. Uh, for example, like computing like this, it cannot be C++ for sure. But it is the great complement to our C++ engine. And it makes it a very good tool for almost everything. Once you write in Python or wrap your engine to Python, you can do everything. That is a very, very good trait of the language. So that's what we will do. And our purpose, which cannot be forgotten, is that uh, we want fast speed. 
And when we are talking about fast speed, we are looking at the machine. That is the machine which gives you fast or slow runtime. So when we are writing the Python program, we see through the Python code to the C or C++ implementation. Then we see through the C++ or C code all the way down to assembly. A lot of time, we actually need to inspect the assembly to know whether or not we are doing right or not. Like if my compiler is doing something stupid that is generating SSE for an AVX capable machine, I need to fix it. I probably won't be able to fix it in Python. I can fix it in C++. Or I just write assembly. If I need the speed or the speed is granted uh, for this kind of necessity. Another important concept here is that we need to use array because that is the most fundamental data structure for us to compute. Uh, in fact, I don't really think it is a data structure because it is just something lined up flatly in memory. Well, but it is a structure, right? Uh, you need some kind of regularity so that you can devise algorithms that takes everything straight from the source to the destination, or you can devise an algorithm that has a rather complex or random access pattern and calculation. That is how our machines are designed for. So if you follow this kind of programming concepts that like you are going to write fast program. Um, on top of that, when we are writing the program, we do not really want to have a lot of memory copy. Sometimes it is unavoidable, so we have to do it. We just do it. But we, if we can avoid copying those ex expensive data around, uh, by expensive, we, we mean actually sometimes gigabytes of memory. So you, you, you don't really want to cap, copy like three gigabyte per your iteration, right? So you probably want your buffer there and you have your algorithm or numerical methods to just get the data and put it back, but don't copy them. So zero copy across any programming constructs is important for us to uh, retain the wrong high speed uh, from in various scenarios that this kind of difference can be as much as 10x or 20x if we manage or mismanage the memory buffer. So when we are combining Python and C++, it is important that we have a way to safely have the memory buffer managed. And I will recommend every one of us to start with C++ so that we have a bottom-up design. Like here, we have our C++ container or engine managing our memory buffer and have our C++ application directly on top of it and have your Python application as an add-on to your internet system. Because if you do the other way around, you need to understand every bit of Python for how it is managing your memory buffer. Well, Python is a well-written language and library. You can treat the whole runtime as a library, but you still need to understand it. A lot of time, like when you are delivering an application, you don't really have the time or resources to understand the whole interpreter. So the left-hand side, the bottom-up approach will give you a healthier system to begin with and give you longer mileage. And Python will be used in many places. One, uh, uh, one major use case is to quick prototype. So we build something new and fragile in Python. We know it is fragile. So we don't really need to make it very robust and install every piece of engineering construct like tests, like regressions. Of course, we need some of it, but this is a prototype. Don't test too much. So that we, this is an example saying that you need to develop a very special case thread pool. We know that Python is very bad at threading, right? It's getting better, much better. Okay? We know we have some Python code developers here or maybe listening online. Of course, we are doing a great job, but we are not saying Python threading is as good as C++, right? No. 
But it is very easy for us to prototype. So if I need some threading support, I need it in the superficial level to, to know, for me to understand whether or not I'm making a right move, I should do it in Python. I can finish this in like uh, maybe half a day. That's great, right? And later, when I know, okay, this is good, my boss say, okay, let's go ahead, then we take it down to the C++ and use our system, a prototype system, as a sample or even the test case so that we can move on and build a robust system. Another thing is to prototype something rather complicated, like our uh, Laplace equation solver, that uh, we want to know whether or not our uh, naive intention of our point Jacobi algorithm is right, then we just write the Python version. And we know it is iterating element by element in the array. That is exactly what we will do in our C++, right? Like just we saw. So we just write it in Python, see if it is giving me the same answer as my analytical solution. If it is, I take it to C++, enjoy the like 150 time speed up I get. And this, again, is my test case. But in production, that uh, we will be facing a complexity problem again, that we will have many, many, many data, and we will need a flexible way to process in them. For example, that uh, this is a simple uh, fitting helper that uh, we do for one thing. And if we, I have a lot of such data sets, then I need a way to iterate through them, right? So this is a, uh, 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 this is a, a C++ kernel for me to do it. So I already have a C++ helper, and I have a Python driver to drive for it. The interesting thing is that the total runtime is like 1.5 seconds. I spend like 1.25 seconds in the data preparation. The calculation is only taking like 0.2 seconds. So there is a lot of time spent in my preparation, in my driving code. That doesn't sound right, right? So we take everything to C++ to see what it will happen. Well, what happens is that those boilerplates uh, or supporting functionalities in C++ is taking no time. All right, then we have a problem here because we really want to drive the whole thing from Python. But Python is not fast enough for us to drive the things then we actually need to design something to manage the data flow. So the concept of making data objects is very important for our hybrid architecture because uh, sometimes that you just need your data flow to be in C++ as well. But you also want to drive it or test it from Python. So here is the basic structure that you do have a class in C++ and you store your data. Uh, and in real case, of course, you will have more sophisticated data structure inside. But the key is that you have multiple inner functions, like inner one, inner two here. They are representing a private, a public interface to your algorithm or a private implementation to your algorithm. By separating the public and private thing, you are able to have your outer batch operation interface that can be called from Python for the speed. And you can test everything, and you know that compiler is taking care of getting the right code being executed and linked. That is the general structure. This is a more rather involved application that I do have some data arrays inside and uh, I wrap it out to Python using a uh, Python 11 wrapper and drive the whole thing from Python and plus something uh, to show to myself for debugging or for the applications. Uh, this is a bad drawing, I know. That's, that's an, as amusing as it should. Um, but having the data to be managed in C++ and wrapped to Python, you are about to 
benefit from the both worlds. Then we can also make the tasks available in Python. And a lot of times that you actually can develop right in your test cases so that you, you write the task in Python. Of, okay, the sequence is that you first have the wrapper from C++ to Python. Then you write the task in Python and it's done. Okay, so the execution flow is very, very streamlined like this. So if you start with Python, you, you actually will have a longer stream of development that the you prototype in Python. You write C++ helpers, and you need to test your C++, right? And you wrap the Python, and you have Python application, and test Python again. Everything to be deliver, delivered, need to be tested, right? But if you started with C++, you started with the data object. You are not testing it and you directly wrap it to Python and write the Python tests, and you ship it, okay? Of course, if we are not familiar with C++, then the first step will take longer. So it's not as short as it should be, but after you get familiar with the programming, then the step is actually fewer, and you enjoy the same quality of engineering. Okay, how much time do I still have? I think I have five or 10 minutes, right? Okay, assume I have. Um, for that, data objects and the management to work, uh, remember that our fundamental data structure is array, right? So we need uh, some kind of array management in C++, and I, I actually would recommend you to develop it from scratch. That's why I call it a simple array. So simple, that is just one header file. So everyone can just develop it, or you take the source code, modify it to, for yourself, and run it, okay? The key is that to have the things to manage in C++. And to remember that the array is not the vector, and do not make the mistakes of exposing the buffer of your vector. You, well, get segmented in foot, for sure, right? Because array, uh, of course, my definition to array is that it is a memory buffer, does not change the shape, uh, does not change the size. It can change the shape, but not the size. But vector is something that you can actually append. It can resize up and it can resize down. When you resize down, most of the time it doesn't reallocate, but when you resize up, often time it reallocates. And in some platform, it always reallocates. So, uh, we cannot directly use the memory buffer. We need to use the interface. So that is very bad for sharing, uh, for doing the zero copy of sharing the data buffer. We need to develop our own array for primarily this reason. The key concept for developing that is to know the ownership. In Python, that uh, it has been managed by the interpreter automatically so that we don't have a feeling of it. But if you read, uh, the C API of Python document, it uh, put a lot of emphasis on ownership. So it is a uh, universal concept, and uh, the, uh, the graph of it is that to know when and where to allocate and delocate uh, memory or resources. So let's say I have a simple array A. So it has a data buffer attached to it. Okay. Then I create another array B which I copy the array without copying the data buffer. So they share the same data buffer. Then I delete my original array. The system, or if we implement the ownership in the right way, then we know there is still an array B that is holding the ownership of the data buffer. So data buffer should be there still. Later, we delete or deallocate our array B. At this time, when we are deallocating, it should also know that my data buffer has no one owning it and should deallocate it. So that should be happening behind the scene, and we as the application and engine developer should make it happen as transparent as possible. 
we must not have box in it. Or if we have box, nobody is able to find it. So this is some code snippet. Of course, I'm not going to really explain what they are, but we are living in a hybrid world between C++ and Python, so you do have two directions of ownership management. One is that you are here exposing from C++ uh, to Python, and we use NumPy array, uh, NumPy ND array as a standard buffer. It has so many helpful, helpful uh, functions attached to the ND array, so there's actually not another practical choice of the Python uh, counterpart. Of course, simple array is much, much more primitive than NumPy array. So we use the buffer interface to create, uh, it, actually this is a helper from the PyPy 11 library, so it has done many, many things for you. You don't really need to worry about. Uh, probably you only need to write some tasks to make sure that you understand the library in the right way. The other direction is that when you have an ND array or you have a buffer, you need the data to be available in C++. So you need your C++ to understand the ownership or the life cycle of that buffer managed by ND array. So this is a little more uh, rather uh, uh, involved. You need to manage the life cycle in different levels of the library. Uh, so there's uh, some facility that, that we need to develop uh, made mainly for uh, here I'm actually using the uh, unique pointer deleter so that we can uh, manage the life cycle of the Nandi array buffer uh, and connect our Pi object lifecycle with our C++ library. All right, so I think I'm within time, right? Um, I want to, this is the last slide, I want to make a conclusion. The key is that we want a hybrid system. Of course, this is a PyCon, right? So I'm not encapsulating C++ talk in PyCon, no. I'm really talking about a Python and C++ hybrid system. In this system, Python is in, in, indispensable. It is necessary because it is so easy to use and it is so powerful as a language or inter interpreter. But it is also so slow, so we need a low-level facility developed in C++. And we use the concept of data object, which is a very, very simple uh, design pattern to make the data available and the algorithm to be freely implemented in both Python and C++, and we just choose the best world for our code and use the zero copy interface. In general, uh, well, in, compli in complex system, maybe you still have some overhead, but in theory, and you, if you program very, very carefully, there will be no overhead in this architecture. I've done once, um, but if uh, you have a team, say like uh, 200 people, well, maybe you need to do a little bit more engineering work to make sure this hybrid system does not have any runtime penalty. But well, if you have 200 people working on the same project or product, you need to be careful anyway. <laughs> there will be overhead everywhere. In the end, you will get efficient and the system that is uh, capable of doing data parallel fully driven by Python. And that will be a beautiful world for us to program in. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, this is my last slide, and I very thanks for your attention. So do we open for questions? Can you raise, raise your hand again? Uh, the, over, over there. Uh, just, okay. uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. Um, so uh, I understand that like, the idea is um, basically, um, what is it, um, letting, uh, what is it, putting all the calculation burden, like the, all the heavy calculation burdens to C++, which um, I think a lot of, um, the NumPy libraries and all those um, 
yeah, packages like uh, use anyway, like in like they wrap it to C plus plus. So like my question is, um, like for example, like the Laplace equation that you, like you've shown, right. is, isn't it like already like implemented in like one of the, in like one of the libraries anyway? <laughs> I believe so. Yeah, because this is an. Uh, the question is that uh, whether or not the Laplace equation has been solved in the package right. delivery in Python and C plus plus or C or C plus plus, right? I don't know. I I do not have a name, but I believe there's a list of library yeah. implementing this. Yeah. yeah. So I guess like uh, if if it's not like uh, like readily provided in the library, like you would do this to like um, make your own um, program, like like the specific program that you're trying to solve. I guess is yeah. Yeah. So uh, the major problem that uh, uh, we want to solve is actually your problem. Not the Laplace equation that has been coined by Laplace, right? Yeah. Like 200 <laughs> years ago. <laughs> uh, we know it. Uh, we have an analytical solution. We don't install it uh, very, very uh, elaborately already. But so that is an example because I believe that maybe half of the room knew Laplace equation already. Yeah. So that is what uh, I, I try, to, try to use as an example about what kind of problem we are solving. That's a kind of problem. Not the exact problem. The, some of the exact problem is something like this, that uh, this is what we saw for, like, uh, well, we, we, we saw for compressible flow, but uh, more or less it is for aerospace. If you have something like flying at Mach 5, you need something to solve for the flow field and know whether or not it breaks apart. And you do not have a lot of packages doing that. Even though if you are a researcher in aerospace, you probably don't trust code other people write. And you write it yourself, right, right. how to write it in a good way, so that later you can probably sell it. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks for the talk. Do you have any thoughts on tools like Numba, which can already compile most of numerical Python to a machine code? Yeah, so the question is about whether or not we use Numba, something like a just-in-time compiler, to compile it to machine code. Yes, we may, but that is also filled in the framework of using Python as a foundation, right? So it shares uh, the same limitation. And the other thing that uh, I worry about, actually it is a real problem. How am I going to debug the generation of the machine code? No, unless you know LLVN, right? Which is actually a very, very big topic. So if I start with C++ and draw everything from C++, I actually do not need to be a C++ compiler expert, right? Because there's so, ma so much resource available for us to debug it. Like if for some reason that compiler generates misalignment in the assembly, well, I just add the compiler switch to say, okay, don't be so stupid. But if in LLVN or in Numba, yeah, I believe there will be some way to do it. But I need to be an expert for me to fix the problem like that. Yeah. So yeah, you may use it if you are writing code that you are not supposed to sell it. By sell it, I, I mean that uh, if it goes wrong, you will be sued, okay? If you won't be sued if your code, when your code goes wrong, fine. Do whatever you want. But uh, sometimes you will be sued for the code you write. Then I better have a pro so that I will protect uh, our whole product and myself from getting into trouble. Hello. Can, can you, uh, do we still have time for another question? Hello? Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you for your talk. And I have a question about the overhead of compiling with PyBind and linking it to uh, Python. Is it, it does it add much overhead to your system just compiling to you know to link with Python and PyBind? Yeah, it's an excellent question. It is about, it's about overhead added by PyPy11, or in general, the wrapping between Python and C++, right? Um, there is some um, non-negligible non overhead in PyPy11, a lot. So in general, the minimal overhead is you use the Python C API to wrap. 
It has some overhead still, but that is the lowest because everything needs to use the Python API, C API to, to wrap. And Python 11 adds additional overhead on top of that, like how it is to traverse the dictionary or the lookup table for which function you call. You know that in C++ you have all of overloads. In Python you don't really have overloads. So how to combine it as some code to glue them together. <coughs> so the key is zero copy. That uh, we expose the memory buffer to both or either of C++ and Python. It's direct write it. You are not using the Python or Python 11 wrapper for accessing that C. You get it right, you write it, you read it, and I know it is dangerous, but when you want to go fast, you do dangerous things that. You can, you can crash, of course, like fast and furious. Everybody crashes, and you're happy about that, except who are paying for that, right? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but let us see. We want the speed, and we need to do dangerous things. So that we do that in the controlled way, like in the movie. You know, nobody gets hurt except the cars. So that's fine. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, There's an, do I still have an, another time for another question? The time is up. Oh, time is up, sorry. So maybe we can talk offline. The thank time, you very much. The time is up. We will end here. Thank you very much, speaker, for your valuable session. Everybody, please give a huge round of applause to our speaker.